In Scala, unlike for example Haskell, a monad is just a concept. There is no superclass called monad from which all monads inherit. A monad basically is any wrapper class which has a static method, unit. And please note, this is a popular name for the method, it's not the unit type. And that method accepts an element and creates a monad with the element inside. And it also needs to implement flat map, enabling us to chain operations on the monad. We can create a monad from the original element, then flat map this element to a monad of another type, flat map the element inside that monad, and so on. But the language does not distinguish between monad classes and non-monad classes. It's up to developers to hold in mind the monadic rules when they write their classes. Quite probably you can have a long and happy career as a programmer and never use a monad. But what if I could convince you that you should consider using at least some of the simpler ones? Or maybe you already used them without knowing it. There are three of them. Option, Ida and Try. They will help you avoid one thing we should all avoid. In one of the previous chapters I made an example of a method dividing two doubles and how a solution to it was to use one of the special constants of the class double. It's only lucky for us that a double in Scala encompasses those two constants, infinity and minus infinity, and also it has that magical constant, not a number. In many other situations we will not be so lucky, and using certain arguments or combinations of arguments will result in exceptions being thrown. Throwing an exception is equivalent to throwing your hands in the air, yelling oh my god I don't know what to do and running away. It doesn't solve the problem you have, it just hands it to someone else as if it were a hot potato. Never do that, if not for any other reason then at least for the sake of the person who would have to handle the exception instead of you. That person may be you tomorrow. Superficially. Throwing exceptions is similar to early returns, breaks for loops and go-to statements. At some points in the past, all of them were considered valid ways of handling special situations. The function would go to perform some assertions on its arguments or intermediate results, and if an assertion failed, it would early return with some special value. Or it would run a loop computing complex results from elements of a collection, but if an element was something not expected, it would break their loop early. In time, a lot of criticism arose about how these constructs led to unreadable code, difficult refactoring and hard to predict outcomes, and gradually they fell out of use. I very much believe that throwing exceptions is in the same category and should fall out of use as well. There is always a better way to handle a problem than throwing an exception or returning null value. Fortunately for us, there are a few tools in functional programming that we can use. Option is the simplest interesting monad there is. Well, okay, you can always define flat map on the unit type, it will do nothing but yay, it's a monad. That's why I say that option is the simplest interesting monad, not just the simplest monad. You can think of an option as a collection that can have only either zero or one element. Its unit method is simply its constructor, which takes as the argument exactly one element of a given type, A, and returns an instance of option of A with that element inside. If you want to have an option with zero elements, you call method option.empty of A, you will still receive an instance of option of A, even though there will be no element of the type A in it. Underneath, an option with an element is represented by the subclass sum of A and an empty option is represented by the subclass noun. If the function you're writing usually produces a result of type A but for some arguments it's unable to do that, feel free to replace A in the result type declaration with option A and use this functionality. In Terry Pratchett's Discord series, trolls are a quote 
based form of life. Their intelligence is affected by the temperature. They can be very clever when it drops close to absolute zero, but usually they are somewhat less intelligent than average, and they have a bit of a trouble with big numbers, that is, numbers bigger than two. So here we have a field trait troll number, case objects one, two, many, and lots. We have the method partial troll number that will return one of those case objects or throw an exception if the number is bigger than lots. And we have another total troll number method that will return an option of troll number and that option will be either sum of one of case objects or none. Then there is the flat map method of the class option of A, which looks like that. You provide it with a function f, which will take the element of the option and create a new option of type b based on that element. But that will work only if the option actually has an element. If option of a is empty, option of b will be empty as well. We can also chain those flat maps together. The result of the first called function will be passed to the second one as an argument if the result is sum. Then the result of the second one will be passed to the third one, if it is sum, and so on. In the end, we will get some final result only if all consecutive function calls produce intermediate results. If even one of them will end up with none, the final result will be none as well. And since an option can be treated as any other collection, after all it's just a list with at most one element, there's also a wide range of methods which work like their counterparts for more regular collections, map for each, fold, filter, and so on. Even if sometimes it feels a bit weird to use them on a collection which you know that it may have at most one element. And finally, in Scala there is a special case. If you provide the option constructor with null as the element, you will receive none, an empty option. You should never do it explicitly. But sometimes it may happen that you receive a null as a result of calling a third-party library written in Java. If you are afraid that may happen, wrap the result of the call in an option and put your own logic inside option for it. In short, None, an empty option, can be used to indicate that something went wrong or that something unexpected happened and it was not possible to calculate a valid result. Sometimes, though, we would like to know a bit more about what happened. This is the reason why there are so many types of exceptions. They are used not only to panic when something wrong happens, but also to yell aloud what the tragedy was that prevented you from progressing with your computations. Option is certainly too simple for that, but this is exactly the reason why there is either. In its generic form, either is like a union of two values. An instance of either A or B can contain only one element, but that element can be either of the type A or B. Similar to how option of A has two subclasses, some A and none, either A or B also have two, left of A and right of b. So every time we have a function partial foo, for example, which can throw an exception, we can transform it into a total foo that will return an either when b is the type of our valid result and a is a data structure which describes the error. But wait, there is more. And there is a reason why I chose b as the type of the valid result. For either to be a monad, there has to be a preference. The unit method must take only one argument, the element itself, and it has to choose by itself which subclass to use. Also, the flat map method needs to choose what path does it take. Do we flat map to the left or to the right? Scala made an arbitrary decision in favor of right of B, this forever oppressing left-handed people like me. Thanks to that, we can now chain IDAs. If we return a result from a function as an IDA, we can then flat map it to another function. That function will then receive the result of the first function, but only if the result is of the subclass right of B. 
The second function can then produce another result of the type either C or D, which then can be changed to yet another function, and so on. But if any of those chained functions produces an error, the processing stops at that link in the chain. It bypasses all consecutive function calls and returns the error from the whole chain. That's the beauty of using monadic IDA for error handling. It has the advantage of handling exceptions in only one place, without all the mess which exceptions create. In theory, the left part of IDA could be used for anything. It's only how the monadic rules were implemented that make it particularly suited for handling errors. And we use for it both the data itself, for example, as above, the error can consist of a text message describing the error, but also we can take advantage of the type system and create our hierarchy of errors. Error can be a trait, and then we can have classes of IO errors, network errors, invalid state errors, and so on. This is how the default Java hierarchy of exceptions work. If we feel lazy, we can use that hierarchy instead of creating our own. For example, this method pet black cat returns either right of poor or left of throwable. In the next video, we will continue this topic with the try monad, the for yield syntax, and a bit of theory about what a monad exactly is. See you then!